Seashore Macabre, A Moment's Experience, by Hugh Warpole. We had gone to our usual summer residence, a farm perched on the steep hill above Gosforth, Gosforth in Cumberland, where the Druid Cross is in the graveyard, so that foreigners come from the far ends of the earth to see it. For the rest, the farm was hay and chicken's eggs and wallflowers in hot, dusty clusters under the narrow garden wall, and the ducks walking into the kitchen, and Mrs. A, the friendly, soft-hearted and deeply pessimistic farmer's wife, making cakes, hot and spicy, in the cavernous black oven. But this incident, so clearly and sharply remembered, so symbolic, Mr. Freud perhaps would tell me, of all my older life, has nothing to do with the farm, except that it starts from there. It starts from there because on fine days we bicycled three miles into Seascale. Seascale was the nearest seaside resort. It looked then as though one day it might become a true resort. It had long, lazy sands, a new golf course, a fine hotel, and there were little roads and lanes in and about that looked as though, with the slightest encouragement, they might become quite busy, shop-haunted streets. Nevertheless, little roads and lanes, now, after thirty years, they still are. Seascale has never taken that step upward into commercial prosperity that once, perhaps, was hoped for it. I myself am glad it has not. It is the one place of my childhood that is not altered. The flat, passive sands are damp and wind-blown, as they always were. The little station, sticky in the warm weather with a sort of sandy grit, damp in the wet weather like a soaked matchbox, stands just as it always did, as though with a rather stupid finger to its lip, it were wondering whether it should go or stay. No, not on the face of it a romantic place, sea scale, and yet to myself one of the romantic places of the world. We bicycled, my father, my sister and I, while my mother and small brother were driven the three miles in a pony trap. Then, if the weather permitted us, we spent the day on sea scale sands, bathed in water that had always a chill on it quite special to itself. We ate ham sandwiches, hard-boiled eggs and gingerbreads, under the shelter of the one small rock that the beach possessed, if that rock were not already occupied. And we read, my mother and father, the egoist, I, if priggish, le rouge et le noir, if unpriggish, saratinesca. Now it happened that one day in the week was specially glorious to me. This was the day of my weekly pocket money. Threepence the amount, if not already owed for reasons of discipline, sin or back answering. Now it also occurred that on the same day that I received my pocket money was published the new number of a paper, yet I believe and hope in a flourishing condition, the Weekly Telegraph. The Weekly Telegraph was my love and my dear. It cost, I think, only a penny. It's dry and rather yellow-tinted sheets, smelling of straw, licorice and gunpowder, I fancy in reminiscence held an extraordinary amount of matter, and especially they held the romantic short stories of Robert Murray Gilchrist, the serial narratives of young Mr. Phillips Oppenheim, and even best of all, as I remember it, The Worldlings by Mr. Leonard Merrick. There were also country notes, tinged deeply with Cumberland sights and sounds, jests, quips and oddities, ways of cleaning knives and forks, making pillow slips, and curing a child of the croup. What I suppose I am trying to emphasise is the contrast of these happy simplicities with, well, reader, as Charlotte Bronte always said, be patient, and you shall hear. You can see me, small, spindle-shanked and wind-blown, while my family sat huddled beneath the one sea-scale rock, struggling through the spidery sand to the little station, my threepenny piece damply clutched. It was, as I remember it, a day of bright, glittering sun, and a high wind. I am at least certain of a general glitter in the heavens, and fragments of burning sand about my eyes. I fought my way up the slope, 
sand in my shoes, sand in my eyes, sand in my throat. I stood on the higher ground, rubbed the sand from my eyes, and looked back to the distant plum-coloured hills, where the screes run down sheer to Wastwater, and Gable rolls his shoulder. Then into the little station that burnt in the sun so that its paint sizzled. I asked for the weekly telegraph. I cannot remember what he was like who gave it to me, but I do know that I did not take two steps before I had opened the paper to see whether there were a Gilchrist, Peakland story, all about my Lady Swarthmore, and twinkling spinets, and a room darkly hung with tapestries, and some fair child working a picture in delicate silks. Yes, there it was. The horn was blowing through Elfland. The long, slow sands below me were lit with mother of pearl, and there were mermaids near the shore. Mr. Oppenheim was also there, a prince of swindlers, chapter 17. As he walked down the steps of the Hotel Splendide, wondering whether he should try his luck at the tables or no, Prince Serge, I drew a deep breath of satisfaction, took a step out of the station, and almost collided with the wickedest human being it has ever been my luck to behold. Now, wicked human beings are rare. I have, I think, never beheld another. The majority of us are fools, with or without a little knavery. This old man was, although as you will see I never exchanged a word with him, really wicked, capable, I am sure, of real, fine, motiveless villainy, like Iago. He was a little man, bent in the back, wearing a rather floppy black hat, and carrying an umbrella. He had, I remember, a sallow complexion, a hooked nose, and a wart on his chin. I say I remember, but indeed he is as vivid to me as though he were standing by my side at this moment, which in fact he may be, for all I know to the contrary. And now, how strange what followed. As I have said, I almost stumbled on him. He stood aside and looked at me, and I looked at him. His look, as I recall it, was cold, sneering, and mean-faced. Then he turned on his heel, and waving his bulging umbrella in the air, walked down the road. Why of all things in the world did I follow him? I cannot imagine. I was on the whole a timid child, a good deal of a coward. Moreover, I had in my hand my adored weekly telegraph, and was longing to read it. Nevertheless, I followed him. Looking back across all those years, it seems to me that a cloud passed over the sun as we walked along, that the walls of the houses shone with a less brilliant reflection, that a chill, creeping little wind began to wander. That is doubtless imagination. What is true is that the little man walked without making any sound upon the road. He was wearing, I suppose, shoes soled in felt or something of the kind. What is also true is that I was drawn after him, as though I were led by a string. Now I have said that I knew him to be wicked. How did I know? Was it only the idlest fancy? At that time I had but a child's knowledge of the world and wickedness was far from my experience. The nearest to wickedness that I had then reached, perhaps, was the sight of a schoolfellow who had pulled the wings from a fly, or the lustful anger in the eyes of a schoolmaster, beating one of my companions. Well, this little old man with the umbrella had something of that about him. Cruelty and meanness. Are there any other sorts of wickedness? I am sure that this little man could be both cruel and mean. Did he know that I was following him? He must have heard my step. He gave no sign. With his head forward, his back bent, waving his umbrella, so under the windy sun he pursued his way. Beyond the little town we reached paths, soft in sand and with stiff sea grasses sprouting there. We approached the sea, and I fancy that the wind increased in volume, began to blur a hurricane. My heart was beating with terror. A 
sort of sickly pleasure, an odd mixture of daring and foreboding. The little man came to a cottage knee-deep in sand, on the very edge, in fact, of a dune that ran down to a sea where waves were flinging in a succession of fiery silver wheels. Although the sun shone so brilliantly, the cottage looked dark and chill. There was, as I remember it, no warmth here, and the wind tugged at my trouser legs. The little man vanished into the cottage. Clutching my weekly telegraph, I followed. And then, how did I have the courage? What spell was laid upon me so that I did something utterly against my nature? Or was it that my true nature was for once permitted the light? In any case, I paused, my heart hammering, the little cottage as still as a picture. Then I turned the handle of the door and looked in. What I saw was a decent-sized kitchen with a yawning black oven, dressers, but on them no plates, windows, but uncurtained. In a rocking chair beside the fire sat an old man, the very spit of the old gentleman I had followed. The room was dark, for the windows were small. It was lit by candles, and the candles were placed two at one end of a trestle, two at another, and on the trestle lay a corpse. I had never, until that moment, seen a dead person. This figure lay wrapped in white clothes. A white bandage was round his chin. His cheeks were waxen and yellow. So he lay. There was a silence, as there should be, of the grave itself. The corpse, as with horror clutching my throat I more persistently gazed, was that of an old man, the image again of the old boy with the umbrella, of the old boy in the chair. Nothing stirred. I could hear the solemn tick of a clock. But in my agitation, unknowing, I held the door open. A sudden gust of wind rushed past me, and instantly, most horrible of all my life's recollections, Everything sprang to life. The little man whom I had followed appeared at the head of the kitchen stairs, and in the most dreadful way he pointed his umbrella as though condemning me to instant death. The little man in the chair sprang out of his sleep, and I shudder now when I remember his loose eye with its pendulous lid and an awful, toneless grin as he stepped towards me. And worst of all was the way in which the thin silver hair of the corpse began to blow and his grave clothes to flutter. The room was filled with the wind. Sand came blowing in. Everything was on the move. It seemed to me that the yellow-faced corpse raised his hand. Screaming, I ran for my life, stumbling, falling, bruising my knees, tearing my hands against the spiky grass. I frantically escaped. A moment's experience, yes, but, Mr. Freud might say, a lifetime's consequence. Today's story was Seashore. Macabre by Hugh Walpole. It was read by Jasper Lestrange. Thank you very much for listening. Until next time, sweet dreams. <laughs>